Afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, latest Advice Line Live event. I am delighted to have with us uh, today Becky McGuinney, who is from our Advice Line team, and she'll be on hand to share some advice and some kind of practical support around how we plan um, for summer and indeed the upcoming kind of change of routine with schools and colleges and, and things changing. And I'm also delighted to have with us Alice Strakitis. Hopefully I've said that right, who's the founder of Autism Adventures Abroad, um, and he's going to be sharing with us his experiences of traveling kind of around the globe based on uh, conversations that we've had. So welcome both of you and thanks for joining us. And um, so Alex, we hear uh, quite a bit from people through our advice line and through sort of other conversations who feel that travel, particularly kind of travel abroad, isn't really an option or is too difficult or there's challenges to that but mm -hmm. you've visited you know seen from your from your information visited more than 30 countries across the world yep. so what's your experience been of this um travel i think it definitely gets easier the more you do it for me personally um you kind of get into the swing of things i guess but there is definitely Inclusive travel overall is definitely getting a lot better. Um, I did a conference last week in Australia, and that was really interesting to see all the advancements companies are like moving forward and tourism boards, organizations, and working together with charities and mm -hmm. autism focused organizations. So, yeah, it's really interesting to see where it's going. Yeah, it's good, yeah. isn't it? That there's that kind of awareness that. Um, the hospitality sector and the tourist industry and need to do more to, to support people. Yeah, there's definitely still a lot of improvements to be made um, in my own experience, but also listening to other people um, and their involvement. Um, yeah, I think, you know, probably the most important factor is, you know, having an, not an open mind, but, you know, willingness to engage with the disabled community and hear what they have to say and what improvements can be made based on their own experiences. Um, I definitely think that's an important factor for moving forward mm -hmm. in terms of inclusive and accessible travel. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. talking, talking to people about what their experiences are and what they would like to see. So yeah. for you, you know, what what would you like, you know, because as I say, you've, you've traveled all over the what place and um, mm -hmm. You're in Bulgaria right now, you know, as is the beauty of, of being able to do these things, we can beam people in from, from all over, you know, mm -hmm. so, so what can those businesses and organisations do to better support um, autistic people and their families to have the same access to experiences, um, you know, that make it a bit more accessible and a bit more inclusive, you know, what, mm -hmm. what should they be doing? I definitely think the first step is training. There is several organizations I've recently found out about that deal with specifically training businesses in not just autism, but, you know, a variety of disabilities. And it basically reaches, eventually reaches the standard, you know, that's considered not acceptable, but, you know, the bar above that, I would say. Um, in the US now, there's a company, um, IBCCS, and they're actually giving out certifications to businesses organizations and even cities now as well for mm -hmm. autism certified which is like i guess the next step up from autism friendly yeah um, and that basically means that i think 80 percent of the staff at least have been trained fully in um dealing with autistic customers patrons so yeah it's, it's having that better understanding and awareness isn't it and yeah. And here at Scottish Autism, you know, we have a, a you know, our kind of training and, and, and mm -hmm. consultancy and very much kind of keen to work alongside businesses to find solutions so that they can um, be more accepting. And I suppose I liked what you said there around sort of that going beyond that autism friendly that, you know, mm -hmm. we're very much about naturally thinking a bit deeper about that. And, and sometimes yeah. it's, you know, Yes, it's about knowledge and, and training, but that's really the first step, isn't it, for a lot of businesses? That's the initial step. There's yep. a whole, it's how you put that into practice and, and what that actually be, looks and feels like. Yeah, 
very definitely important. it's the willingness to be inclusive you know if you've not got the willingness to change your business patterns or strategy to be more inclusive then it's just not it's not going to work out so yeah, yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. um and and you're part of um you know quite a, a network now of, of other uh, people who are sharing their experiences of traveling and, and things like that and it's something that you're really keen to do isn't it sharing your experiences yeah. Yeah, it's amazing the people you meet while you travel and also, yeah, engage with the community. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So really a kind of a, a, a network of, of, of people there that, that can inform this process and, and be part and, and of kind of that development of, of what this, what those experiences feel like for people. Um, and you're looking to capture some of that, aren't you? Are you telling me you've got a blog and, and things like that up and running now? Yep, as of today. <laughs> today, um, half the press. <laughs> yep. And yeah, for the most part, I've just been doing Instagram up until this point. But yeah, over the past year, I've wrote in about 30 articles. So yeah, wow. I'm hoping to start getting those live and running. So yeah. Great. Yep. And our team in the background are going to uh, post up uh, links to where you can find. Uh, information about what Alex is, is doing and, and where he is and it links to his blogs and you know, say you've got a, a website that went live this morning am I right Alex so it's, <laughs> it's brand new um with brand some information new. so um and uh, say the team will will post details of how to get in touch with Alex um via that but um you know certainly once I've read it sounds it's really informative and really really interesting um in terms of those experiences um, but Becky, I wonder if I can bring you in at this point. It's, you know, for some people, it is about going abroad. It's about experiencing the world. But sometimes, actually, it's that shift and change in routine, isn't it, that, that um, some of our families and indeed some of our individuals that contact us through the advice line are just looking for a wee bit of support on, isn't it? Yeah, it can be. I mean, I think everyone thinks the summer is really exciting time you know on the holidays and a lot of children really look forward to it for some it can be quite anxiety inducing um, and I think it's really important for parents and supporters to sort of recognize and acknowledge how huge an overhaul it is mm -hmm. um, for some individuals for their routine and I think if you're kind of considering you know the changes in the weather and places are much busier there's a lot more crowds we tend to do a lot more socializing you know we're outdoors mm -hmm. so I think kind of coming from that place of acknowledging that it is a big change and sometimes those big changes can sort of cause some you know upset and sort of challenges that maybe don't usually kind of exist in the day-to-day -day, especially you know for individuals who maybe are studying or maybe their work schedule changes or for children at school mm -hmm. um, so yeah I think it's important to sort of just first start from acknowledging that um, and mm -hmm. I think that's the best place to sort of come from that empathetic point of view yeah yeah I think it's really it's that acknowledgement that mm -hmm. you know there is some change coming and and I suppose kind of thinking about, you know, how do we sort of reduce this, the stressful nature of that change? Um, so from, from your perspective in terms of, you know, the work that you do with, our, with some of our families, either through our advice line or through uh, the National Post Diagnostic um, Service, you know, what, what, what can supporters do to, to make that, that shift and that change in routine or, or indeed that kind of, journey to somewhere else you know if the family are thinking right you know let's try a holiday you know maybe somewhere local or somewhere within Scotland or indeed further afield what can what can supporters do to try and make that less, a little less stressful for everybody involved yeah I think probably a really good thing is and I think it's striking a balance between you know the summer is the summer and there should be change in routine because you're you're off school but I think if there's opportunity to keep some sort of, you know, small morning routine or maybe the evening routine, whether that's, you know, you wake up, eat your breakfast, brush your teeth, and then you shower and get ready. You know, this, this doesn't need to be 
an elaborate sort of element to your day but if it's something that's continuous that can kind of bring a lot of continuity mm-hmm. um, and a bit of comfort and expectation of well my day's always going to kind of begin the same mm-hmm. um, and that can cor- cor- that sort of starts you off doesn't it as a kind of calm start to your day so I think that can be really useful um, to sort of introduce that um, I think in terms of like taking a trip or maybe an activity that you maybe don't usually do I think forward planning um, and a lot of kind of discussion about what we're going to do when we're going to do it and families will know very well you know how much warning their child or the individual they support needs you know whether that's a week in advance a few hours um, sort of allowing them that space to maybe watch a YouTube video on it or look at some photographs of where they're going maybe kind of orientate themselves about what to expect you know what kind of sensory experiences they might have when they're there, maybe talk through them. Um, If you know they have particular triggers or things that they really don't like to do, maybe don't, you know, you can avoid doing them. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the best sort of way to approach sort of different activities. And then I think for parents, especially, you know, it can kind of come with a lot of pressure to fill your days and make sure you get you know as much fun in with summer holidays um but I think ensuring that you've got that time to sort of decompress that quiet time you know perhaps where they do get to just engage in their sort of preferred you know activities or you know get to hang out at home I think that's also really important to have that balance there and so it's not too overwhelming Mm -hmm. yeah because I think there's a lot of pressure on families isn't there to have a good time definitely summer holidays or you know we've gone to a certain place we're going to have a good time Mm -hmm. Um, but you know kind of taking time to do something that's joyful like for everybody as a family and and for siblings and you know mom and dad or whatever that family dynamic looks like also you know recognizing that um you know joy comes in all different shapes and sizes isn't it and you know it might be about you know um you know sort of playing on a on a computer game or whatever that might be um, but also you know making sure that you know families and supporters are taking time for themselves as well in that in that process so that everybody can get something out of it but, um, but yeah so um, and in terms of you know I thought it was great what you said there Becky around you know to, are there key I suppose what you're are you saying there is that trying to find those key moments in somebody's routine and trying to kind of keep those consistent would that be the sort of advice that you're giving yeah definitely I think you know everyone has things that work for them you know that kind of support and maintain a status of well-being and I think you will you know we all kind of recognize them within ourselves and parents will know what what works best for their child whether that's you know they need to be in bed for a certain time or up at a certain time um I think just whatever it is that kind of provides that continuous sort of yeah sort of a regular routine and mm-hmm. um, that brings comfort I think that's really necessary that could be something like you know if there is a sort of schedule that they use at school whether it's like a visual support you know you can use that during the summer at home if that brings that individual that kind of comfort you know you don't you can schedule in we're going to play in the park for an hour you know you can put that on your timetable it doesn't need to be a timetable full of you know really elaborate activities Mm -hmm. and but perhaps that visual aid or support is what's required for that individual to enjoy their day to enjoy their trip out or you know their holiday whatever it may be so yeah I think pulling in those elements from your usual routine out with the summer can sort of make that change and allow you to kind of engage in different activities and um, situations you know happily so yeah I think that's definitely the advice there yeah absolutely it's just it's finding you're writing what you're saying it's finding what works isn't it for you as a as a family or for or as a group or, or whatever your dynamic is um you know and I know Alex you you travel sort of on your own don't you a lot so you you know is that something that you're sort of looking at right okay you know my my travel structure is the is the same each time or yeah no I think I agreed pretty much with everything Becky said um it's definitely important to realize my own triggers. Um, also, I do a lot of research before I go anywhere. Um, it kind of just gives me a bit of reassurance, I guess. Um, 
about certain things and you know after a while you kind of know what to avoid or you know um what works best for you what things I always take with me when I go somewhere mm -hmm. um yeah so it is a bit of trial and error to begin with but it does get easier as time goes on for me yeah mm -hmm. yep. and, you, know, you know having those sort of um you know I suppose we, we all kind of have things that we take along with us don't we that you know thinking yeah. I'm you know going away myself in a couple of weeks and already started making the lists of things that we're you know we're going to need and it's you know kind of making sure you're doing that getting those that, that preparedness in place yep. and things like that and in terms of um you know, I know we had some feedback in one of our other events around, you know, um, sort of uh, places and, and, and I suppose hotels and, and, and camps and, th and things like that, you know, who, um, and I suppose the question to you, Alex, is, is when, what can they do more to support people who, when they're actually right, you know, we've talked there around like the travel and actually moving from one place to the other, but there's also that piece around, you know, when somebody arrives in that destination and, um, you know, they're at their hotel or, or whatever it may be, what, what can they do more to support and make, make the experience more inclusive for people? I think definitely, you know, it's when it comes to that, I think attitude's a big thing um, for the service provider, you know, um, if they are friendly, you know, like reassuring, if they sometimes it's just as easy as like checking on the person if they're okay if they're comfortable having a good experience I think that goes a long way at least in my experience um mm -hmm. so I think it's just the little things can make like definitely a big difference um and of course being in having an inclusive mindset um will definitely go far I mean if someone if an autistic person has a great experience and like a hotel or something, for example, then at least for me, I'd probably recommend it to other autistic people, you know, um, mm -hmm. say, you know, this hotel is great. They do this, they do that. Um, they go a step further than like other hotels. So yeah, definitely small steps can make a big difference in a person's just day in general. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, you know, I'm kind of sensing a sort of uh, overarching theme we've had throughout our kind of our Iceland live events around you know we're not talking about huge big um, mm -hmm. you know in a lot of cases huge big changes or, or, or adjustments if you want to call it that it's, it's little things that make people feel that they've been recognized and, and considered in that process that, that mean a lot to people. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, so I'm um, just checking to make sure that we're not missing any questions. So uh, everybody who's watching, if you do have a question for Becky, either from a, 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 an advisor perspective or indeed for Alex, please do pop them in the chat there and we'll pick them up and, 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 and Alex and, and Becky can, can answer them. Um, but while we're, we're sort of waiting for those questions to come in, Alex, I'm really, um, obviously we mentioned there that you have traveled to more than 30 countries across the world. So tell us a little bit about your, your travel. Like where, where have you been? I know you're in Bulgaria right now, but where have you been? You know, give us some holiday recommendations. <laughs> um, so my first, I guess, yeah, I guess you could call it solo travel, but um, yeah, I moved to Japan when I was 20. Um, or language school over there in Tokyo. So it wasn't really travel per se, but it was my first like solo experience by myself. Um, and that was probably like a turning point in my life, I would say when it came to like, I don't know, branching out, seeing different parts of the world. So, cause I mean, that's a way at the other side of the world. Yeah. Um, no similarities to anywhere in Europe. <laughs> 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 so yeah um but I had a great time that was very I guess eye-opening um okay. about just the different ways people live their lives but also like you know the possibilities and mm -hmm. everything that's out there that you don't realize um mm -hmm. yeah wow. yeah it was it's quite a quite a culture shift to Japan, yeah. you know uh, um and I know last time we spoke as well, you were in Croatia, I think. Is that yep. right? Yes. 
So and I'm in the Balkans for the next uh, few weeks, I think. Yeah. Right. Yep. Wow. And and what was your experiences in Croatia then? You know how how was that? Was it was it over? Yeah. You know, was it good? Was it bad? Like. So I spent the first few weeks in Zagreb. I was in a hostel there, um, and it was fun. I made a lot of friends, but by the end of those three weeks, um, it was a bit too much. You know, there was a lot of, it is a party city. So I think okay. I could only do a few. Yeah, I can't do any more than that <laughs> anymore. Yeah, so after that, I just went myself down the coast. Um, Mm -hmm. checked out like Zadar, Rijeka, Pula mm -hmm. um, and I mean you meet people along the way you always do but you always have that space to do your own thing and they do their own thing there's no expectations regarding that so mm -hmm. um, that's one way I can kind of decompress and like you know just have my own time do my own thing so yeah and connect with people along the way sounds, yeah. sounds lovely yeah. um, and um and where are you hoping to go on to after, because it's Sofia you're in, in, in Bulgaria at the moment, yeah. isn't it? Where are you hoping to go on to after that? Um, so I have some friends in Belgrade right now. Um, wow. Yeah, in Serbia. So I haven't made any plans yet, um, but maybe towards the end of the week, start of next week, I might head over there. Yeah. Wow, that would be, mm -hmm. that would be exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I've actually got a question here for you, Alex, from Harris. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know if you're able to answer this, ha okay. um, but Harris would like to know, Alex, have you ever do you drive and have you ever driven abroad? And what is it like to drive or supposed to be driven on the opposite side of the road? So I have driven abroad, but only on the left hand side when I was in Australia. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so, yeah. Um, actually, I was going to try it once in Spain. Um, my uncle lives in Spain in Alicante, but I mean, I got in the car and I was like, I don't think I can do this. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I'd maybe give it a go some other time. But yeah, for the moment, I can only because it's the same side in Australia. I didn't have so much of a problem. Um, I didn't have to readjust or anything. And uh -huh. the road system's kind of the same, I guess. So, yeah. OK, so there's those, you know, there are some, I suppose, cultural similarities in some different countries where you can you know I, suppose, I mean I'll, obviously Australia is quite a quite a journey over there but I suppose as well you know kind of going back to Harris's point you know you find if you do feel hey, I want to travel I want to be abroad you know there are some mm -hmm. options there are some countries where there's some cultural kind of similarities and things like that isn't there where you can yeah that. there is a lot of British people in Australia especially so um yeah, you wouldn't have much trouble finding them if you just go out. Um, lots of Scottish people as well. Really? I'm surprised. Yeah. Wow. I wouldn't have thought. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so hopefully that answers your question to, to some extent. Um, it's, uh, I'd say I've never driven on the other side of the road either. And I think I kind of share Alex's thoughts and I'm not quite sure how I would feel about that. And Becky's shaking her head too. Yeah. I think it would take some getting used to, wouldn't it? Um, in terms of that. So, um, Becky, I wonder if I can come back to you, you know, in the sense of, you know, obviously we've got these kind of dual perspectives and, you know, just, you know, holidays don't, doesn't, don't necessarily have to mean, um, you know, uh, going abroad or, you know, going somewhere super exciting. Sometimes it can just be about staying at home and, 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 and having that experience and you spoke there around you know um building in somebody's routine and, and things like that but I suppose if the you know if families are sort of thinking this year you know we're, we're sort of out of the kind of I suppose more um restrictive restrictions um to do with COVID and things like that so we do have a little bit more freedom and, and I suppose because we've been at home for so long people might be starting thinking actually you know I might go abroad and and obviously we've heard you know kind of um situations where you know just recently travel plans not going to plan and, and planes and things getting cancelled so um you know I know some of our families that is you know they're kind of you know well what if this happens and if that happens how can I so what would be, be your advice in that sort of 
that pace, you know, those unexpected, and, and I'm sure Alex, you've probably encountered those unexpected events that happen when we're traveling. What mm. would you, you uh, Becky, I'll come to you first. What would be your kind of, um, your thoughts and advice around that? Yeah, I think that's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I think a lot of the time, especially for parents, when we do kind of encourage that forward planning and sort of discussing with the children and sort of trying to kind of prepare for anything that you're going to go do. And obviously there is always, you know, it's life. There's always something unexpected that crops up that you don't know what's going to happen and you can't plan for. Um, and I think everyone's got a bit of fear struck in them with the airports and the queues and, you know, that in itself, if that was to happen, that could be quite a, you know, difficult situation for some families. Um, I guess, you know, I think if you can control your own, feelings I think it's definitely as a support worker or you know as a parent I think trying to remain calm yourself is a really important thing which again can be difficult if you're in a stressful situation but I think if you're kind of you know demonstrating that it's not that overwhelming for yourself then that means that you're more capable of sort of supporting the individual and um, I think always having you know whether it be you know, your headphones that are sound defenders, if it's something that's, you know, triggering that sense, the iPad to watch their favourite show, their favourite toy, their favourite snack, you know, something that is going to bring maybe a bit of comfort in a very kind of stressful moment, um, I think is probably a good sort of plan to have. Um, and I also think you'll probably bring a certain amount of things anyway for travel like that for on the plane etc but perhaps having you know your backup you know you know definite sort of solution in your bag as well I think is really important um for the individual as well if that brings them that comfort in a very heightened situation mm -hmm. um, I think that would probably be the best way to go about it and then if you can remove yourself from the situation you know if you can ask is there a quiet area that we can go and wait in and someone else can wait in the line for you you know requesting help I think in those situations is totally understandable as well and hopefully there will be some way that you can be supported and um, so yeah mm -hmm. so it's just sort of yeah I suppose being sort of I think in those sorts of circumstances what's that in is that kind of what if you know it's good to think yeah. of those what ifs but I, and I know you know like for the likes of Edinburgh Airport for example they they invested a lot of time in thinking about what does that customer journey look like through their airport and so I know there is a lot of um a lot of avenues that people can explore and it's a bit you know I suppose again the advice line is there if you want to talk through that scenario with with one of our advisors um sometimes it's good just to talk it through isn't it and and just you know kind of or we'll do this, that, and the other, and if that, that happens, this is who we'll call, or, or if you want some kind of advice and signposting about who to get in touch with, um, at, you know, either train stations, you know, I know rail companies have, have um, particular departments that are there specifically to support those people who might need something additional, and to do airports, you know, let us know, give us a ring, as I say, and, and, and Becky and others within the team are on hand to kind of give that advice and that signposting. Um, but I suppose from your perspective, Alex, you know, as a, a very experienced traveller, you know, what, what are your sort of, um, what's your advice, you know, when things don't go quite according to plan and it, it doesn't go quite right? Um, I think the mindset I try to live by, it doesn't always quite work out that way, but it's hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Um, yeah, I did have a, more so before, a habit of, I guess, not expecting too much, but, you know, expecting everything to go to plan. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the way you always w want things to go. Um, but I guess when you travel, especially in airports as well, as you were saying, yeah, it doesn't always, especially now. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I have some friends in Manchester and apparently that's like the worst one in the UK right now. Oh, dear. So, yeah. But. Um, just to, because I agreed with a lot of the points Becky said, just to add on top of that, there's also the scheme they're doing now. Um, it's not just in the UK. I think lots of airports around the world do it now, but it's the uh, Sunflower Lanyard. Mm -hmm. I'm sure yeah. if you guys have, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, for some people, that could be like extra reassurance as well, you know, because then I think, I'm sure Edinburgh as well is also doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I saw someone 
last time I was there. So yeah, I mean, the staff are trained or at least should be to, you know, give extra support to anyone wearing these lanyards. So mm -hmm. um, that could definitely be some extra reassurance if airports are very stress inducing. Yeah. Good start for a lot of people, yeah. So I suppose the, the sort of message out there to hospitality and, and tourist industry is, you know, who do I go to if I need some help? Like, and will you be able to help me? That's what we're asking. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So Alex, I have a couple of questions for you actually. Um, one is from Roth here, and he wants to know, um, as an autistic, um, autistic person, is there anywhere that you've been where you necessarily haven't felt as supported or as safe? Is there any, I'm just asking if there's anywhere that's where it has been difficult? I don't. Yeah, I don't think I've really felt that way specifically about one particular destination. Um, I mean, anywhere you go, the culture is going to be different. And I don't know, I kind of get this feeling of it's almost like, you know, like a lot of things that in your own culture would be seen as like, I don't know, an autistic trait or whatever. People just pass them off as, you know, it's because you're from a different country or a different culture mm -hmm. you know I don't really yeah it's hard to explain it into words but oh, it's, it's, yeah it's kind of like that no I like that thank yeah. you Alex. thanks mm -hmm. hopefully that asks, answers your question Ross mm -hmm. um I have another question here from Sabana apologies if I mispronounced your name um but Alex how do you adjust with new foods abroad um, or what do you suggest about foods abroad you know for somebody who may be you know that that is part of you know the um you know they need to be, feel reassured by that mm -hmm. well going back to before definitely the stressors like first working out what your own stressors are and you know possibly like looking up the location that you've chosen to go to and sometimes it could be like avoiding public transport or you know, I can't think of anything specific right now, but yeah, mm -hmm. or yeah, it's just working out, you know, like what works best for you and going towards those things, avoiding everything else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also keeping with little routines sometimes really helps with me, um, especially with food. I always have like set times I like to eat. Um, I've never really broken away from that. So yeah, as much as possible, I try and stick with that. That can help a lot with a full day ahead, really. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I suppose as well, I know obviously there's there's restrictions in what you can carry in your hand luggage, but if you're taking check luggage, you know, I suppose mm -hmm. thinking, you know, if I do have things that, you know, I really enjoy to eat and I feel reassured having them with me, can you put them yeah. in a check suitcase so that they, they're coming with you, if you like? Mm -hmm. um you know and, and i think you know what you're saying there is um you know researching the cuisine of that country you know uh, mm -hmm. don't like hot spicy food then you know cultures that use a lot of spice may you know may not may not suit so again i think it gets back to your point earlier alex about that research doesn't it and yeah you know, those, those spaces to be able to do that and yeah. support to do that as well i think as well yeah i think for anyone but even more so for, I guess, autistic people. Um, and I love doing research anyway. It's not like a chore for me. I always like to find out all the different aspects before I go somewhere. So yeah, yeah, it really helps when I actually get to that place because then I kind of have, I don't know, I guess an idea mm -hmm. of, you know, like where to go, what to look for, where to avoid, mm -hmm. um, places to eat, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll save everything to maps. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's going to be on your website and on your blog as well. And we can all benefit from that research and experience that you have. I've got one question here from Gary. Um, and he says, is there something refreshing or liberating about leaving behind a culture? Um, or the, and you touched on it before, the kind of social norms or what might be perceived as an autistic in another culture might not be like is there 
you know, that means there's something refreshing and liberating about leaving behind the culture or social norms of your homeland. Yeah, I guess in a way, I mean, I think for anyone, there's always going to be aspects of your own culture that you don't quite agree with or fit in with. So, yeah, it's always nice to see how different people around the world live their lives. And, you know, sometimes those aspects more fit in with what you see yourself as or, yeah, it's... Mm -hmm there's so many different ways people live their lives around the world and like seeing that firsthand is mm -hmm. pretty special yeah yeah right um so i think that concludes the questions that we have and so thank you to everybody who who sent in a question there and hopefully we've been able to answer them um colleagues have also said if there's something that you want to ask specifically um that's more uh feels more private or that you don't want to share in the, the chat just now then please do drop us a message um, and or you can email into the advice line um, at, at advice at scottishautism.org um, and colleagues will also post all the details of how to get in contact with the advice line and indeed if you have any other questions that you'd like to ask Alex then please do forward them on to us and we can we can get them over to Alex as well um, if you have any specific questions but we'll also uh, post some details of, of how to get um, a link to Alex's website. And I think you've got your you've got contact and you're on various social media platforms as well, Alex. Um, just Instagram for now. But, just Instagram yeah. for now. So you can get see Alex on his travels as well on Instagram. I'm certainly going to go away and give you a refollow. So I want, uh, the same before we came live, I've always wanted to go to Sofia. So I'm definitely going to be having a wee look and seeing what, what's been going on there. So I recommend. <laughs> it sounds amazing. So. Thank you so much to Becky and to Alex. Really great discussion um, uh, this, this afternoon. And thank you to everybody who's joined us. Uh, please do keep an eye on our Facebook and other social media uh, platforms for upcoming events that we might have. And they're also all uh, listed on our website. So to say, please do keep uh, an eye out for future events that we'll, we'll have up and coming. Um, and again, thank you, Becky. Thank you, Alex. Thank Take you. care, everyone. <laughs> Bye.